ladies and gentlemen. It's a shame I've never been before in this church, but this is a marvelous occasion. I'm deeply honored to introduce Paul Volker. He is truly extraordinary in many respects. He's extraordinary, above all, for the jobs he has held. He was at the center of the international monetary policy making for several decades. He managed the delicate process of abolishing the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates at the beginning of the 70s and the first developing country debt crisis in the early 80s. And what is more, as chairman of the American Central Bank, the Fed, he fought an unprecedented battle against inflation in the aftermath of the second oil price hike. All this did not come out of the blue, ladies and gentlemen. Paul Volcker was probably born a central banker. When he was appointed at the Fed in 1979, one of his friends said, that it was as though he had trained all his life to play the piano and now was finally allowed to play the best instrument in the world. It was the largest instrument in this field in the world, perhaps the best I don't know. Indeed, in 49, 30 years earlier, he had already a summer job at the New York Fed and he began working there sometime later after he had earned his degree in public administration at the famous Harvard University. Soon his career took off. He went temporarily to the private sector, but quickly returned to serving the public interest, strongly influenced by the sign on his father's desk. You go into the public service for public good, not private gain. Paul Volcker held high-ranking positions at the Ministry of Finance under Presidents Kennedy, Johnson and Nixon. He thus had experience under both Republican and Democratic administration. This, ladies and gentlemen, was one of the reasons why he was so suitable for the job of chairman of the Federal Reserve System. Interestingly, he was appointed chairman by the Democrat Jimmy Carter and was reappointed by the Republican Ronald Reagan. It was the man, not his political background, the U.S. needed at that time. Paul Volcker is extraordinary also on account of his physical appearance. Indeed, he played basketball at Princeton University. If I am well informed, he talked about it more than actually doing it. Nevertheless, it would seem appropriate to call him the Michael Jordan among central bankers. <laughs> As chairman of the Fed, he was the political cartoonist's dream. His towering figure and large cigars made him an easy target. Journalists said of him that he's easy to spot, but difficult to question. I'm confident that he will prove the opposite today. There is another extraordinary side to Paul Volcker that is perhaps not generally known. His roots lie not all that far from Amsterdam. He was born into a German family. His grandfather, being a German immigrant from near the Dutch border. It's not news to you, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but when you come to think about it, you could say that the soil in this part of northwestern Europe is particularly suitable to growing the best central bankers in the world. For Hans Tietmeyer, the current president of the Bundesbank, stems from around the same area as Volker. And only some hundred miles to the west, Wim Duisenberg was born. <laughs> the best qualified candidate for becoming the first president of the future European Central Bank. And incidentally, ladies and gentlemen, and in all modesty, I come from the same... <laughs> 
neighborhood as Hans Tietmeyer. But I'm not, I'm not convinced, I'm not really convinced that Paul Volcker himself is fully aware of his well-nigh Dutch origin. Apparently, during a large international meeting on the dollar crisis in 1970, a representative from the Netherlands made a proposal to help solve the trouble. And Volker's reaction was, and how many divisions do the Dutch have? <laughs> but this had nothing to do with his German background, I suppose. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Undoubtedly, the most extraordinary period in his life was the time he served as chairman of the Fed. When he took office in 79, he was confronted with an extremely unbalanced economic situation. Inflation had surged to an annual level of around 13%, and that, for the most important country, economic country in the world. And Falk, Volker developed a unique way of controlling inflation through operational targets for money growth. And he broke the back of inflation. It was the start of monetarism in the United States. By the way, more than 25 years after the introduction of quantitative monetary targets in the Netherlands. As he explained in October 1977, the classic definition of inflation is too much money chasing too, too few goods. Fundamental change in American monetary policy was discussed within the Fed at an emergency meeting on a Saturday in October, the Saturday night special. Volcker's pragmatic monetarism was not undisputed, to say the least. Interest rates rose from 11.5% in the summer of 79 to more than 20% a year later, with enormous repercussions for the exchange rate of the dollar and later on also for the stock markets. Most delicately, 1980 was also an election year in the United States. If anything, ladies and gentlemen, Volcker's approach was courageous. The American economy, and with it the world economy, had to undergo a severe adjustment process, only by means of a shock therapy, and it was quite a shock therapy, was he able to reduce inflationary expectations in the U.S. And in doing so, he confirmed that two guiding principles should consistently be high on the agenda of monetary policy making, price stability and the independence of the central bank. And that brings me today's, to today's subject. Paul Volcker will share with us his view on economic and monetary union in Europe, and the floor is his now. Thank you. Well, Mrs. Wertheim, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. President, I want to thank you for that generous introduction. I have never before in my life had an introduction that told me so much about myself that I didn't know before. But I did know about uh, that ancestral uh, heritage. I once had the occasion of introducing Hans Tietmeyer in the United States. And I indicated to them that if historically the border of the Netherlands had only been put five miles further east, we both could have grown up to become vice presidents of the National Bank of the Netherlands. I did go into basket I did go into central banking because I couldn't find any central bankers that played basketball and I wanted to win someplace. But I uh I have a little concern that I am here under false pretenses. 
Now, Ann Wertheim, uh, if you didn't know her before, you got a little taste of the fact that she is a very persuasive and innovative young woman. And some months ago, I don't know how, she somehow got hold of the fact that I was going to spend the day in Amsterdam. So she set out to convince me that the entire future of Dutch-American relations depended upon me spending a few minutes at the John Adams Institute. Perhaps we could have a cup of coffee and a few friends could drop in and we could speak informally. She has more friends than I could count on. We did get some coffee. Now we have this glorious historic setting. I am a bit concerned that with the remains of Rembrandt to haunt me, if I fail to live up to that generous introduction, I will be in trouble. Now more important uh, in terms of false pretenses, you may be under the impression that I'm about to explain to you the American point of view on the Euro. And it's true that despite my ancestry, I'm an American. But I don't think there is any clear American view. And to the extent there is one, I am not representative of it. I'm certainly not representative of American academic opinion. And I don't think I'm representative of American official position, although, of course, they are very discreet in their public comments. I'm not representative because I happen to think the Euro is a good idea, a good idea whose time has come, a logical and crowning achievement for the European community. Now, in contrast, the typical American economist, at least, and I think a good many European economists share this concern, is that the time may have come, but it's nonetheless a bad idea. It's an idea fraught with potential for European political friction as well as economic malaise. Now, my personal first response to that concern is that the common currency isn't only or even principally an economic matter. That here, at the end of the 20th century, I share the vision of Chancellor Cole and others that it really is time to draw the curtain, once and for all, on the nationalistic rivalries on this blooded continent. Time to add real meaning to the new nomenclature of the European Union. But I also happen to believe the economic benefits will be real, not compared to some textbook model of the way an economy might work, but compared to what are really the practical alternatives. Now, the economist's concern is that individual European nations will be giving up important tools of economic policy. National monetary policies will, by definition, be extinct. There will be, by definition, no possibility of exchange rate adjustments within Europe. Demonstrably, fiscal flexibility is closely hemmed in almost everywhere by political forces and otherwise. And the European-wide stability pact will reduce the degrees of fiscal freedom even further. With national labor markets rigid and cross-border cross labor mobility difficult, if not entirely frozen, means of economic adjustment are pretty much gone, or at least so the argument goes. Europe will be doomed for a long time to live with large areas, even whole countries caught in a trap of sluggish growth, unable to extricate themselves, caught in a vice of German-like monetary policy fixated on price stability. Now, of course, the new European Central Bank, unlike the Bundesbank, should direct its policies toward the needs of Europe as a whole. But, the critics say, monetary and exchange rate conditions that may fairly reflect average European conditions 
will frequently be out of keeping with the needs of individual countries. Instead of contributing to European unity and harmony, the result will be frictions and discord. A pretty powerful indictment, but I don't believe it. Why do I take a different view? Well, the logic seems easier to explain here in Holland, where you have had long experience of tying your currency to the Deutsche Mark. The logic of wanting exchange rate stability as a key ingredient of a true single market seems to me compelling. Competition will surely be increased. I know multinational companies will no longer be able to charge one price in Amsterdam and another quite different price in, say, Lisbon or Madrid. Investment decisions will be more frequently based on underlying economics rather than in a more defensive mode of producing where you sell for fear of exchange rate instability. Big swings in transatlantic exchange rates will not any longer be so threatening. Now, there's no magic in a common currency that will eliminate the possibility of depressed areas. But I have to point out the freedom of Italy to change exchange rates hasn't appeared to do a thing for the Mezzogiorno for about 50 years. The key problem for Europe is more flexibility of markets more incentives to work, more incentives for innovation. In that connection, a great deal depends on whether the introduction of the common currency will stimulate those adjustments faster than if the crutch of devaluation is held out as an alternative. Now, in practice, I don't really think there is an alternative for individual countries taken together. Now, it's one thing for an individual maverick, say the United Kingdom, to gain temporary benefits when everybody else holds still. But logically, it's not possible for all European countries to value against each other. Flexible exchange rates have strong advocates on the wider world stage. But what we know from experience is that very large and capricious exchange rate fluctuations can be anticipated even among close trading partners in a flexible exchange rate system. Large changes meaning changes of 20 or 30 percent or more over a brief period of time. Fluctuations of that kind within Europe would be far larger than consistent with any notion of purchasing power or competitive parity. And faced with the prospect or the actuality of exchange rate changes of that magnitude, it would be hard for me to see, in fact it wouldn't be possible for me to see, that the common market could in fact become a true single market. It's simply naive to compare the difficulties inherent in a common currency with a textbook model of gradual and smooth adjustments in exchange rates, gradual and smooth adjustments that simply don't exist very often in practice. Now, of course, it's concerns of that kind that have led to repeated efforts to stabilize the intra-European exchange rates within narrow margins, and again, the Dutch experience has led the way. For the core countries, at least, there has been an almost single-minded emphasis on achieving domestic price stability to support that stability in exchange rates. In the process, members of the union, de facto, have found, already found it necessary to coordinate their monetary policies with the German center. So given those, that situation, given those policies, the ultimate step of abandoning separate currencies seems to me not so revolutionary and will in fact relieve the tensions inherent 
and the possibility of speculative attacks on one national European currency or another. Now, given all of that, it's obvious that whatever the longer-range advantages, the Union is now entering into the most sensitive and delicate stage of the transition. The underlying economic circumstances, prolonged sluggish growth, and high unemployment are not ideal, to put it mildly. Many commentators have made the point that assuming a critical mass of countries do decide to proceed, both monetary and fiscal policies will be further constrained for some time ahead. Fiscal policy will have to meet the stability criteria. Monetary policy will be alert to the need to establish credibility as the new central bank takes its formation. The construction of that European Central Bank is a unique enterprise. I don't know of any precedent for still independent countries, in effect, ceding monetary sovereignty and management to a jointly sponsored entity. An entity without a parallel governmental body with which the central bank can interact. And it's set out not just by domestic law, but by international treaty. That is the extreme of central bank independence. Now, how you deal with the potential tension inherent in that arrangement is a matter for Europeans to decide. But if I can be so indiscreet as to make an observation from abroad, I do not happen to believe any central bank can long be comfortable as an island unto itself, operating entirely outside a political context, broadly defined. By one means or another, in democratic societies, important official institutions must be able to justify their policies to the general public and to the political leaders. So that need is going to present a special challenge for the new leadership of the European Central Bank. And I'm even tempted to say I can think of a man who might be up to the job. But the challenge extends more broadly to finding useful ways and means of communication with governments without undermining the essential attribute of independence in decision making and operations. Well, so much for the euro in a European perspective. What about the external side, the euro and the world economy? Now, you begin with the simple fact that the European Union, in total economic weight, will about match that of the United States, by some measures a little bigger. Consequently, the common currency will have implications for all of us, and arguments have begun to rage on all sides. Now, I've heard a lot of debate about that in recent months by Europeans and Americans alike. How much will the euro influence financial markets? Will it be strong or weak? A rival to the dollar? Will it replace the dollar? Will interest rates be higher or lower? I hear every view and every side, and every time I listen to some uh, distinguished speaker on the subject, I'm convinced by his position. <laughs> but I must confess I end up agnostic on it all. There are too many variables, too many uncertainties to be dogmatic. Even something so straightforward as the consolidation of Europe's official exchange reserves has ambiguous implications. The mechanical effect will be to reduce the total amount of reserves. But on the other hand, the need for international reserves by the European collectivity will also decline. So the balance of supply and demand is not clear. So far as the use of the euro in markets is concerned, I suspect for some transitional period, the inherent uncertainties surrounding the operations of the new central bank 
and maybe more important, the underlying European economic situation, will discourage really sizable shifts of either official or private liquid assets into or out of the euro. But let's look beyond the transition period. Then I think we have to expect more fundamental forces to take hold. In time, a common currency should certainly encourage more competitive, flexible, and liquid financial markets in Europe. So, other things equal, the euro might indeed come to be considered more on a parity with the dollar as a reserve and trading currency. The desire to hold more euros would presumably tend to strengthen that currency. But on the other hand, as a trading currency, as a financial currency, there will be more borrowing in euros by those outside the area who will in turn sell the euros they borrow for other currencies. Now where the balance of supply and demand lies depends upon a lot of other things that are only held equal in economic textbooks. Will internal stresses, sluggish growth, aging populations, and the cost of social programs lead to persistent European fiscal deficits and ultimately raise doubts about the priority given price stability? Or will broader financial markets and needed economic restructuring enhance European competitiveness? And I can ask the same questions about U.S. policies and performance, and I can ask the questions, but I don't know the answers, at least not with any conviction. I think we can be pretty sure that judging from the course of human events, that things will not always go smoothly, that doubts political and economic will arise not only in Asia, but even in Europe and the United States from time to time. One thing I can tell you with great conviction, being a reserve currency is not a one-way ticket to a strong currency. Not for long. You can buy a lot more dollars today or a lot more pounds today than you could have done 30 or 40 years ago with a Dutch gilder. Now one issue worth considering is what we should be doing collectively to deal with that uncertainty and to enhance stability among currencies and markets. In a very direct sense, a successful euro will reduce instability of exchange rates and the volatility of international financial markets. It will do so simply by eliminating a number of important currencies. That's a central purpose. The question that remains is whether the creation of the euro, successful in that intra-European objective, will also tend to stabilize transatlantic and trans-Pacific exchange rates and capital flows. Now, one theoretical possibility is that with two such large and relatively stable economic masses, the United States and the European Union facing off, their currencies should move in a relatively narrow margin vis-a-vis -vis each other. Both will have strong central banks determined to keep inflation under control. Presumably, relative competitive positions and price levels should change rather slowly and relatively predictably. Similarly, small and gradual changes in equilibrium exchange rate values would then be appropriate. With firm expectations about equilibrium exchange rates, Inevitable cyclical fluctuations in interest rates could be accommodated by relatively small adjustments in spot and forward exchange rates. It's a nice picture. It's the one you learn in Economics 101. 
but I wonder whether it will have much more correspondence with reality than many of the theoretical expositions of how floating exchange rates might work back in the early 1970s. The closest test case we have is not reassuring. The exchange rate between the two largest world economies today, the dollar-yen exchange rate, has been notoriously unstable, rising and falling by more than 50% over the last three or four years. Now, presumably, the new European Central Bank and the European fiscal authorities, faced inevitably with difficult internal challenges and tension, will be at least as indifferent about the external value of the euro as has been the case with the United States government about the external value of the dollar. Certainly, trade external to the union itself will be, if not de minimis, it will be less important than foreign trade has been to individual European countries in the past. And there is a certain ambiguity implicit in the Maastricht Treaty, implicit in reality, I might say, as to where the ultimate responsibility for exchange rate management lies just as in the case in the United States. I can well imagine governments on both sides of the Atlantic not eagerly wishing to commit their prestige, their policy, or their reserves to a matter that has little political constituency. Now, if markets do sense that governments and central banks are neglectful, benignly or otherwise, of the desirability of exchange rate stability, huge amounts of capital could easily be mobilized to ride a trend. And with two main centers of economic power, it may be even more difficult than now to find a forum and a focus for international decision-making and to achieve a political consensus. It is, I fear, a potential recipe for impasse. Given the size of the major currency zones, I suspect the influence of some authority purporting to represent the wider international community, in a word, the IMF, may be weakened rather than enhanced. The now chronic difficulty of managing fiscal policy at all flexibly even for de evident domestic priorities, may well be reinforced. <clears throat> now, we can take comfort, I suppose, in the thought that even if concerns about the instability of the dollar, euro, yen exchange rates are borne out, we'll still be a lot better off than with a multiplicity of European currencies. Perhaps that true, that's true if we look at the exchange rate system in isolation. But I think we would have to agree that the situation would hardly be ideal. And recent events illustrate again the added complications of instability among the major currencies for the much more fragile emerging economies. Now, my hope from all this is that those three poles of economic and financial power, Europe, the United States, and Japan, will indeed find it in their mutual interest to work more closely together and with the IMF toward greater exchange rate stability. But I also know that is not, not for the time being at least, a very popular idea. But I've now lived long enough to have learned one thing. Intellectual fashions change, just as they do in other areas of life. And I'd like to think that the creation of the euro, with its profound implications and promise for European political and economic life, could also become the impetus for renewed thinking on the broader international front. Thank you very much.
much, Mr. Mr. Volker. You promised to limit your introduction to 30 minutes so as to give the audience the opportunity to ask questions to you. Who wants to do us the favor of kicking off the discussion? It's always a little bit difficult <laughs> in the beginning, and I have a list of questions myself here in front of me, but honestly speaking, I would prefer if you took the lead. Nobody? You're going to get somebody else from that area up there where yeah. you all come from. Yeah, Mr. De Credit, please. budget uh, surplus block in the world and might uh, stand a, uh, a surplus block for quite some time. Now there is demand and supply and for this reason the supply of euro will be to some way limited and the demand for central bankers will be quite substantial. So the outlook might be that uh, for the longer term the euro will be a stable to a rather strong currency in relation, for instance, to dollar and the yen. Do you agree with this view? Uh, in a word, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think there's, there's too much uncertainty, but I, I'm surprised to hear you say that Europe is a budget surplus area. That had not been my impression. And reason, I didn't know anybody was a budget surplus area recently. Ah, trade surplus. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, well, let me make a few comments. I, and I think the future is fraught with uncertainty. And I, the advice I would give you or anybody else is don't put all your eggs in one basket about which way these currencies will go. It's only relevant, I suppose, for a long-term uh, bond. But I, I thought you'd said budget uh, surplus. Because one of the strongest arguments made in favor of the euro being strong made with great force is that Europe will run big budget deficits and therefore will have to have fairly high interest rates to counterbalance the budget deficits which will make the currency strong. And, it, and other people will say, well, you run a budget surplus, it will make the currency strong. So take your pick. The trade, uh, you know, the trade surplus idea presents an interesting dilemma. You're not going to be a big reserve currency and run a trade surplus because your big cur uh, reserve currency by definition you have a big capital inflow a big capital inflow is is uh, not consistent uh, with a with a trade surplus so you got to make up your mind whether you want a trade surplus or be a reserve currency uh, now I'm oversimplifying a bit but I uh, I, I suppose what you would like to see is both the United States and, let's say, a current account. Uh, we both should naturally be, I won't go this far with the textbooks, in uh, trade surplus and the rest of the world ought to be in trade deficit and we ought to be lending to the rest of the world. And then we can have a little contest. We'll do a better job at that. But that's too simplistic a picture and I don't know how it's going to come out. But, but could you dwell a little bit further upon, upon this issue? Because what, it, what is in the offering is, is, is the following. Europe is running a surplus on the current account. It's not only a trade surplus, it's no, surplus on the current account. account. And uh, it is running a surplus on the current account that is increasing. 
it's it's one and a half percent for the area as a whole at the moment it goes to two percent and if the budgetary consolidation process goes on in Europe there is a chance of even higher surplus on the current account at the same time we have that famous Japanese surplus and then two of the three blocks uh, major blocks in the world are running surpluses well whether that might result in a weak or strong dollar I don't know but uh, it might it might result in, in severe tensions between Europe and the United States as we have seen tensions between Europe uh, between the United States and Japan what is, what is your view on that? Well, you're maybe running a current account surplus now, but it's also running unemployment of what? 12%, well, 15% yeah. on the average? We'll see whether Europe is running those big current account or sizable current account surpluses if the economy was growing a lot faster. And I would suspect we historically have not had a chronic problem with Europe running a big surplus and the United States running a big deficit the way we have with Japan. So I would suspect, I don't, I don't see any reason really, I guess, structurally, why Europe should be running a big current account surplus and creating problems with Europe I U.S. Think, relations. Yeah, well, I, I don't know, and I see your point, uh, the point of uh, picking up an economy uh, uh, implies, picking up of an economy implies indeed more imports and a reduction in, in the current account. On the other hand, you are in a very special country at this very moment. Our economy did pick up, and, and our surplus on the current account, and our unemployment rate went down, and our surplus on the current account is on an ever-increasing path. Uh, well, according to the forecasts, uh, I think, of about a surplus on the current account of about 8%. Well, it may not be, be yeah. right at this point. I wasn't aware of what your current account is doing. But I think the Dutch experience, and you can educate me, is kind of interesting looked at from afar. Because here, you have, in effect, had a common currency with the, the Germans. Yeah. With the Germans. Yeah. And you have had a German rate of interest necessarily and lost uh, much independence of monetary policy. You are in the situation that many of these, let me call them academic, I don't think that's necessarily a dirty word, but academic critics that I criticize of the Euro. And they say, you know, you get caught in the kind of situation that the Dutch are caught in, you're at the mercy of the Germans and you're not going to do very well. But my impression is that the Dutch, in fact, and you had a very considerable problem, have one way or another managed to introduce elements of flexibility in the economy uh, more greatly than most other European countries. Yeah, and that leaves you in this happy situation of having growth, relatively low unemployment, and an unchanged, an unquestioned, not just an unchanged, but an, really an unquestioned exchange rate. Now, how did you do it? Because I would argue that this is possible for all of Europe. And the fact that you give up the idea that you can change your exchange rate, you're then not left with anything to do except do what you should be doing anyway, which is making, I would think, some of the reforms that the Dutch have apparently made. Yeah. I think that that's a correct assessment. and uh, We made our markets more flexible than, than for example, France or Germany. Uh, in the, the recent years. Who wants to take part in the dis discussion? Yeah, Mr. Bester. Well, after, after hearing such an eloquent uh, plaidoyer for the Euro and coming from <laughs> such a distinguished uh, America, there's some discussion among the uh, Europeans. What number of countries should join the, uh, the Euro in the stage as of May, as of uh, the 1st of January 1999. Now, strictly speaking, only one country, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, complies actually with the criteria of Maastricht. The United States does pretty well, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> but, you may ask me whether you are prepared to answer the following question. From your perspective, would it be better to have all of the 11 countries who are eager 
to join the, the Euro now, or should we have a kind of judgment? Who are the strictest and who are the softest? Well, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going I, to answer I should, the question. I should no. keep quiet and turn yeah. it over to you. No, 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 no. no but, but since not. this is a quiet little coffee clutch, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I hesitate about what to say. But let me just, in the, in the nature of reporting, say I was in Italy uh, briefly a month or so ago. So I stopped in to see one of my other old central banking colleagues, Mr. Ciampi, who's now the Minister of the Treasury of the Budget and a few other things. And he was very happy to see me because he could bring out some charts and show how their budget deficit had declined and was on the road to being less than 3% of the GMP and it was doing better than Germany's and doing better than France. I don't know what the Dutch are doing. Even better. <laughs> Even yeah. better. Yeah, 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 yeah. His price, the price performance in Italy has been better than in Germany. I don't know what And then in, then in Holland, yes. Then yeah. in Holland, yeah. too? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Uh, he showed me a few other figures against the Maastricht criteria. And all I say is it kind of raises the question. <laughs> it's a little, and they're very eager to join, you know that. Uh, it takes a, uh, a fine European judgment to decide how to keep them out, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> you should be the next Chancellor of Germany. <laughs> yeah, but perhaps could you dwell a little bit upon the, the sense, the, the, the usefulness, let me put it that way, of the convergence criteria. That is a less political uh, issue. Is it is it useful uh, to, to define a certain ceiling, 3%? Well, I, I think some of those, I mean, I, I, mean, I, <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting in this embarrassing territory, but well, I, I, <laughs> <that's what laughs> I, I have never thought that all the convergence criteria were exactly uh, models of... Uh, clarity in terms of uh, the qualifications for entry. I think some of them are very important. It, the, the idea of having an established convergence on prices, which is a basic criteria, I, I think is a central criteria and it ought to be adhered to. Uh, the criteria reflecting the exchange rate stability themselves is, is obviously relevant. And the idea of the debt criteria relative to GMP, when you started out with one country uh, not very far from here that I think had double the criteria to start with, yeah. but was considered as a, always been considered a right candidate, I mean, it's a very arbitrary number. What's the relationship between debt relative to GMP and, and the real criteria for stability in the future? The budget one is, is closer, but there's no allowance in that criteria for the cyclical position of, of Europe. And the idea of running a balanced budget, I, you don't have to be a pure Keynesian to think that uh, running a balanced budget with the levels of unemployment in Europe now uh, may not be the most prudent economic course. But yet the, the criteria are expressed so rigidly, there isn't much, I guess there's a little, but not a lot of allowance for that kind of uh, judgment. So I think it's kind of a mixed bag. I think some of the criteria, particularly relative to prices and exchange rate, are very important. The budgetary ones obviously have a bit of arbitrariness about them. Even though you understand what they're after, I, you want... You don't. You want some prudence. Part of the trouble with a, a budgetary criteria so much depends upon uh, the basic savings rate in the country. For instance, Italy always looked like it had a wildly high budget deficit, and it did. And I don't want to defend it, but they also had a very high savings rate, which makes it easier to, uh, and maybe even necessary, to have some budget deficit relative to another country like the United States that has a very poor savings rate. But 
the criteria don't take that into account. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, and let, let's take the case of Italy. Italy has the debt ratio of what is it, 120 to 130 percent. And what does it mean? Uh, the implication of such a high uh, uh, debt ratio is that an increase in the interest rate, for example, as a consequence of tightening of monetary policy, has an immediate and very substantial impact on, on, on the budget deficit. Let, let, let's just assume, uh, for the case of the argu argument that interest rates uh, would go up as a consequence of, of that monetary tightening, tightening process with two percentage points. In the Italian case, it would mean uh, an increase in the, de uh, in, in the budget deficit of, of almost 2% in a rather short period. And then you get uh, the internal dynamics uh, of too high a deficit. Uh, so, so I think you're right in saying that, that you can't determine the precise figures. But what is at stake is, I think, that what we wanted to do with the Maastricht Treaty is to go back to more normal public finances. And that is to say that when you go to the 50s and 60s, most of our countries were, in terms of the definition of the Maastricht Treaty, running budget deficits of almost zero. That was the normal situation. So this is more or less back to normal. And I think back to normal can't, can't be that bad. Well, I'm not going to, I probably am verging on making a sermon in favor of budget deficits, which I don't want to. No, no, I know you're different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that, but, but you know, the, the point you make about Italy is running in reverse now, of course. That's why yeah. their the important reason their budget deficit is declining so fast is that people expect they will be in the, in the common currency, so they will have the same interest rates, or close to the same yeah. interest rates as the rest of Europe, much lower than they used to have. So the budget deficit's gotten a lot better, simply yeah. because people expect them to be in. Yeah, but that, 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 that's a windfall profit, of course, yeah. what they get. But it, yeah. it's well, it's yeah. it's windfall, but lasting, if they are members, presumably. Yeah, that's that's correct. Other other questions. You should speak a little bit slower. Yeah? She doesn't understand uh, the obscurity of the echo is an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yes, please. Well, my position is what I uh, attempted to say in my remarks. Uh, it's hard for me to say any central bank is too independent, but uh, my concern is, is not the independence per se, but I, I do think it's, it's desirable that the central bank not be put on such a pedestal that in some sense it doesn't have to communicate with people and defend its actions. And I'm not saying that's going to happen in Europe, but it is, uh, it is unique to have a central bank with independence guaranteed in effect in the Constitution uh, without a strong political body to, with which it can interact. Now, there's some things in the treaty, as I understand it, that deal with that point. It has to go testify before the European Parliament, and if the European Parliament had more authority, that would be more effective, and it's useful as it is. But uh, I, I have a certain sympathy, but I, again, I have to be very <laughs> careful here, because uh, it's subject to different kinds of interpretation. The creation of some European body on a political front to kind of interact with the central bank I think would be healthy. It's not healthy if you conceive of that body as something to impair its independence. 
but I think you can retain essential independence and still, as is true in the United States, but it's also true in Germany, it's uh, that the central bank does have to interact with the government. Now, it so happens in Germany, of course, that the basic political support is <laughs> is very strong in supporting the Bundesbank, which is fine, but they at least have to... Uh, a government can raise questions with them, and they have to be able to explain themselves to a government. And certainly that's true of the Federal Reserve, where the public support isn't quite so automatic and instantaneous as it is in Germany. But uh, it's a very aggravating process if you're in the central bank, but I think in the end it's a necessary process. And that's all I'm saying. I mean, uh, yeah, it is. I, I think in a sense, but I have to be very careful also yeah, in what I'm saying now. In a sense, it's, it is a second best solution. And what I have in mind is it is a European solution for a European problem. And what I'm implying by that is that the institutional framework in Europe, the institutional political framework, is still rather weak. That's the first no, point. That's, that's, that's and and the, second, the second point is that, that there's no stability tradition in, in, in all our European countries. And given these two phenomena, uh, what we try to do is to find a European solution. But it's, it's quite clear that the European Central Bank should address this, this problem in its daily behavior in that sense that it should do more to my mind than there is in the treaty nowadays. It should go to the public and it should go to the parliament and it should do that uh, in, in, a, well, uh, in, 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 in such a way uh, that you do not lose contact with uh, the people you're representing in one way or another. So I fully agree on, 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 on this. And what we did in the beginning during the negotiation process is we tried to sell the Dutch model uh, to, uh, to Europe. And the Dutch model is a model that at the end of the day uh, gives the responsibility to, to, to the government. The government can give a directive to the central bank, but it never did it. But having said that, I myself, I'm during the process also convinced by the two points I mentioned earlier on, the weak stability tradition and, and uh, that weak uh, institutional framework. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Mr. Stengel. Um, Mr. Volker, you have also addressed the issue of the political context in which this uh, management of the euro has to take place, right? Now, uh, we in Holland believe that it's absolutely vital that in other large economies like Spain, Italy, France, budgetary prudence exists, uh, is adhered to, in order to have a stable, internally stable currency. Now, could you give your assessment on whether you feel that, that the stability pact, which has been agreed in Amsterdam, uh, is really uh, a realistic um, tool to achieve that um, budgetary uh, proof? And second uh, element, could you um, express your view on this idea? Isn't there a moral hazard problem built into the system? That is, that there is an incentive to cheat in that for large economies, um, if you run a big budget deficit, that is a matter of, say, European concern, and you can offer to reduce your deficit, but then that you expect that Brussels takes also care of certain problems you are facing. So that it becomes part of the general bargaining process within Europe. <laughs> Is there... <laughs> That's difficult because I was dreaming away a little bit. Well, well, I can. I, 
Let but me, it's, let it's me, about bailing no, out. Well, let me, it's let about me, bailing out. I think there were two elements to the question. One was, uh, you know, isn't it important to have some mechanism to assure fiscal prudence in this new system, particularly when you have some countries that have not had a habit of fiscal prudence, and an absence on their part of exercising fiscal prudence will put a special burden on others. And in fact, once you get the common currency, if I understand the question correctly, there may be a positive incentive to abuse it, in effect, by uh, uh, permitting you to borrow more than you could otherwise borrow, or be willing to borrow, because there won't be any exchange rate consequences. I'm elaborating on the question a little bit. And so you will have a positive inducement if you're so inclined to run bigger deficits rather than smaller deficits. And what do you do about it, I think, is, is the question. Uh, I want to come out, of course, four square for fiscal prudence. And the question is how you apply this. And it, what, I'm not familiar enough with the latest iteration of the Stability Pact and what happened in Amsterdam. I'm sure it was sensible that it happened here, but I'm not familiar with it. Uh, but I think the inherent problem is how you define it statistically, because budgets are sensitive to the state of the economy, and that's the only kind of question I, I would raise. So when you begin talking about number X should not be exceeded, and that's the number, well, you know, it all depends. It's too big a deficit if you're in a boom, and it's too small a deficit if you're in a depression. And how do you, how do you deal with that problem? I guess I would approach it by saying, yeah, it's, it's kind of rough and ready, but you approach it by putting in some number, but leave yourself enough leeway to make some judgment in appropriate circumstances that that number is not appropriate. And maybe it's just as important uh, you worry about the fellow who's going to have bigger than 3%, but you also worry about the fellow who's going to have 3% in the midst of a boom. That's not very good policy. But it's very hard in this very politically freighted area to, uh, to make these judgments, uh, and so you fall back on something that sounds pretty arbitrary to me, but I don't know quite where they are. My impression is they're less arbitrary than they started out. And so long as you allow yourself some room for judgment, I think having some benchmarks is probably a good idea. And I do think there was, got to, should be some kind of procedure that if a country appears to be, uh, you know, barring excessively, taking advantage of the leeway that the common currency may give them, that there ought to be mechanisms within the common currency to bring pressure on that particular country in a flagrant case which I think is part of the stability pact, I guess. I, uh, now, in the end, of course, uh, the ability of a country to borrow indefinitely is not unlimited because there's still ultimately a credit concern. Uh, but that may be a pretty loose uh, constraint, and you may want to get at it before. Standard and Poor's and Moody decide to downgrade them, I eh? Yeah. Well, to, to my mind, for the stability pact, the same holds as uh, for what I said before. The stability pact is, is a European second best solution. In that sense, there is, that, uh, there is no minister, ministry of finance in Europe. And since there is no uh, uh, financial authority uh, for Europe as a whole, you, you need another device. Uh, and, and that device is the stability pact. It's an agreement between, between countries on how to behave in the budgetary field. And then you need you know, more or less hard and fast rules. Otherwise, nobody is, is complying with the, the rules if they are too loosely formulated. And, and I think that on the whole, the stability pact is, is as I said, the second best, but not too bad a solution. On one condition, on the condition that we go back to the normal budgetary situation of deficits about zero. If we are not going to reach that figure, then indeed we are in trouble 
uh, when uh, we get the next recession, because then there is no scope for the automatic stabilizers to function. We used to talk a lot in the United States, in some degree elsewhere, about the idea of the guideline ought to be a balanced budget in full employment. But that concept sounds nice in concept. I think it is a nice concept. It's along the lines of what you're saying. But it's very hard to measure. There are all kinds of statistical yeah. difficulties in determining what the budget would be in conditions of full employment. So that idea... But I think that concept still is, is relevant, even though it's very hard to measure. Next question. My name is Kostash. Mr. Korka, if you would be elected as a new president of the European Central Bank mm -hmm. next year, what instruments do you think would be available to defend the value of the euro and to, to get the target of a stable Policy. A stable price policy. I, I think most central banks now, and I haven't been following the European situation closely enough, but most central banks have decided that the most practical thing to do is aim directly at the target of price stability. And they will adjust the mechanisms or the so-called intermediate measures to suit the circumstances aimed at that objective of, of price stability. That in particular the money supply criteria which we experimented with some in the United States, the Bundesbank has paid a lot of attention to, still does apparently. But it must be so different between the different European countries and it has been so unstable in some of those countries. I don't know about every European country, but it's certainly been unstable in the United States, and it's been unstable in the UK. That maybe that's irrelevant, but I suspect there's some instability in in the ones that will be in the unit. That I, I would think, I would guess the central bank would find it pretty tough to say this. This is the money supply target for Europe as a whole, and that's going to be our guiding light. I'm sure they'll look at it. I don't even know whether they can get a consistent definition of the money supply between no. different European countries, but the president would know a lot more about that than I would, eh? Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> told almost everything I, 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 I know. No, there, basically, there are two approaches. First of all, the inflation targeting approach, and, and, and the second approach is uh, that money supply approach. The German approach is the latter one. Um, the British approach, approach at this very moment is, 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 is the first one. I think in practice the difference between these two approaches is not as large as many people think. There are so many balls in the air and, and I think the central bankers also in Germany, they do not look only uh, to money, market, uh, money supply figures, but they also take into account, although they sometimes deny that in public, but they also take into account exchange rate considerations, the conjunctural situation, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and the problem for the future is the instability or the potential instability of the demand for money in Europe as a whole. Uh, we get a, a new regime, so to speak, a new overall financial monetary regime. And it is not easy to say beforehand uh, whether uh, we can uh, stick to that money supply approach uh, that is at this very moment uh, for 20 years already the, the German approach. But I think on the whole the central bankers agree on this issue. They will not be too dogmatic. We will start I suppose, we will start with uh, a money supply approach to borrow to some extent the credibility of the Bundesbank that is one of the arguments but we will quite quite sure about that. We will, as soon as we see that the demand for money is unstable, uh, switch to another approach. And as far as the instruments are concerned, the instruments we are going to use are the traditional instruments uh, we have available for influencing short-term interest rates. Next question.
last part of the question. The question it doesn't, is... It doesn't look happy, but... <laughs> no, is, it, is the euro in the American interest if it turns out to be a reserve currency? Is that the... Uh, I mean, I tend to think the euro, by and large, is in the European interest, but it's not in the, it's not in the anti-American interest. Uh, whether or not it becomes a reserve currency, and I presume to some extent it will become a reserve currency. What I fear is... Uh, and it's a common disinterest of Europe and the United States, I would think, but it may not be realized, is that there will be a lot of instability in the exchange rate. I don't have a fear that the dollar is going to be terribly depressed or appreciated, or the euro is going to be terribly depressed or appreciated over a period of time. I do obviously have a concern from what I said that you have a lot of instability. And when you get a lot of instability, some countries, some other third countries will attach themselves to the euro and some will attach themselves to the dollar. You already have that tendency. You have more of a tendency because there's nothing to attach yourself to in Europe now and so easily. But there will be with the euro, uh, maybe with the yen, maybe not, because there are a lot of political issues in, in Asia. But you begin getting the Americas in Europe going in different directions and kind of ignoring each other, and there'll be areas of conflict and uh, tension around the edges uh, that aren't very healthy. So I would like to see a conscious effort to stabilize the rate. And I think that is clearly in the interest of, let's say, all these Asian countries that don't know what to peg to. And they... Uh, you know, everybody says they ought to have a flexible rate. Well, that doesn't help any if the, if the yen and the dollar are moving by 50 percent. Well, they got a flexible rate in between or what? I mean, they're still lost. Uh, so I think it's in their interest that you get more stability. You don't have to have perfect stability, but more stability. But no, I don't find anybody interested in it. And that's, <laughs> that's what disturbs me. And they're not interested partly because they kind of throw up their hands and say, the markets are so big, it's impossible. We don't want to commit our prestige. We don't want to try to do something that we're going to look foolish because we can't hold the rate. And that fear is very deep-seated. And I also must tell you that financial operators don't have any interest in it because they like all this volatility. Uh, more volatility, the better. Uh, which is a change from what they used to think. But I would look at European experience and say, what do you mean you can't do it? Here the European countries have done it among themselves for 15 years. And they haven't been perpetual turmoil. They haven't been perpetually under speculative attack. They, are, they have been occasionally. And the one that was really under spec heavy speculative attack and gave in was the UK. Well, what was the difference with the UK? The market knew the UK's heart wasn't in it. I mean, you have to believe, if you're going to do it, you have to believe in it and be willing to protect it. But if you do that, my own sense is that the market will respond. Uh, because they're at a loss as to what the right rate is. They don't know. And you talk about an equilibrium exchange rate. Who knows what the equilibrium exchange rate is? But if the government tells them within a reasonable range what they think it is, and it's reasonable, and they're willing to defend it, I think the market will defend it themselves, so to speak. You'll get, you know, in the jargon, you'll get stabilizing speculation instead of destabilizing uh, speculation. Well, that's my pretty little picture. Most people think I'm dreaming. Uh, I'm certainly dreaming of somebody's interested in doing it, but I think the trouble is there's no urgency to do it because the United States can say, look, we're big enough to take care of ourselves. Trade isn't that big. Our biggest trading partner is Canada anyway. Our third biggest trading partner is Mexico. Our second biggest is Japan, and it's got nothing to do with Europe. So why do we, uh, you know, it's not worth the effort. 
And I think Europe may think the same way. It's not worth the effort. It's not that big a deal anymore. So we'll let it go. And if we let it go, I think we may see more instability between Europe and the United States than we've seen in the past. And I don't think that's very healthy because of a kind of broader world consideration. Even if it was okay economically, which I don't really think it is, because I, I think it leads to kind of inefficiencies, but uh, I think it is not good because it is it tends to push us apart instead of together. Isn't there also, uh, Mr. Volker, involved the risk in stabilizing the exchange rates between major blocks in the world? That's what we did or tried to do in the second half of, of the 80s. And I'm now I'm referring to the Japanese case, the consequence of, of uh, the fact that we gave it a try at that time was to lose a monetary policy in, in Japan. The result of that policy was a bubble. The result of that bubble uh, was soaring developments in uh, asset markets. And, and, and what, uh, what we see now is, a re uh, is the result of all, all these developments in Japan. So is, isn't there also another side? To this, to this story of stabilizing exchange rates at, at the world level? Well, none of it's very easy, but let me give you... I, we did try in the late 80s. We didn't try very hard. Well, it was a funny situation. We tried, in my view, too ambitiously in the sense of setting out some ranges that were pretty narrow, but we really didn't try very hard. We really weren't, didn't try to defend them very much, certainly not in the United States. Uh, and you get the so-called dilemma cases where certainly had one then. But look at what we had with fluctuating exchange rates in the last few years. You could argue part of the reason Japan is in such a problem now is that their exchange rate got so appreciated three or four years ago that it kind of knocked their expansion in the head and stalled the economy just when they already had enough banking problems and they couldn't grow out of the banking problems because they ran into such competitive difficulties that the economic expansion was non-existent for several years. Now we swung all the other way and everybody's worried about Japan's going to get too competitive and solve their problems and, uh, on our back, so to speak, because the exchange rate is now I mean, I used to say 50%. It is now 60% <laughs> uh, higher than it was, uh, lower. It depreciated, uh, dollars higher, yen is lower than it was two years ago. Other questions? Yes, please. Yeah. <clears throat> I believe you have in the United States a mechanism for financial transfers from areas which are temporarily economically depressed to uh, areas, uh, sorry, to areas which are temporarily economically depressed. Um, such a mechanism in Europe we have ruled out. We have adopted uh, a no bailout clause. Um, in the light of your experience in the United States, do you think that is a position that is realistically uh, sustainable? If you look at the bond markets, they don't believe it. The, the interest differentials between the various uh, participating countries have narrowed to within 100 basis points. And if you allow me another question directed at President Welling, could you think with us for a moment about the unthinkable? Let's jump 10 years ahead and the system breaks up, the union breaks up, what would, it, what would then happen to the Netherlands? What would happen to what? To what Netherlands? would then happen to the Netherlands? Your question. To, to what? what would happen to the Netherlands if the system <laughs> would break up? <laughs> okay. I think the Netherlands would be very eager not to have the system break up. Is that a fair... That, that uh, is a fair <laughs> and adequate answer, yeah. Uh, but on this first question about, you know, the fiscal transfers within the United States, that's an argument that's used all the time, uh, with obviously some validity, that the United States has more fiscal flexibility in that sense. If you have a depressed area, it will get some assistance from the federal government, and there will be automatic stabilizers. 
they, you get depressed, you'll pay less federal taxes, and you'll get more unemployment insurance and so forth. But I, I think to some degree that would happen in Europe, too. That doesn't have the same fiscal, he gets back to the stability pact. But you get a normal cushioning effect from the budget of individual countries that you now have from the federal budget if you don't change the tax rates or change these spending policies uh, because you have to meet some fiscal uh, stability pact. And the United States no longer, if it ever does, you know, it doesn't have massive programs of regional assistance. Uh, it's got political fights, and some areas do better than other areas, and you tend to do a little better if you're in a depressed state. But uh, this image of the United States having huge fiscal transfers to take care of uh, cyclically depressed areas, I don't think apart from the automatic stabilizers, is as important as people make out. And of course, I could say, and a lot of other things have changed, the United States had a common currency when the federal government had, was tiny, and there weren't any offsetting uh, fiscal payments. Yes, this is the last question, I think. Yeah. Thank you. If you favor uh, a common currency for Europe, would you likewise favor a common currency for Northern Europe, for Northern America, for instance, the United States, Canada, and Mexico? And if not, why not? Well, I, I favor stability, as much stability as I can get between Canada and the United States said Mexico, uh, I think Mexico is perhaps not in a quite stage that I want to lock them into the dollar too much. But uh, I mean, basically, it's their choice. Uh, if Canada wanted to fix their currency against the dollar, I have no problem with that at all. In fact, you know, the political situation is such that no red blooded Canadian would ever admit that it wanted to tie its currency to the dollar. But de facto, they're pretty careful about not letting it fluctuate too much, I think, for good. And they, we are very big trading. They're big trading partners of ours, but we're an overwhelming trading partner of Canada. In the old days, 90% of their trade, I guess, used to go to the United States. Now it's less, but I, it must be at least 75%. And they have to be, you know, a bit careful about that exchange rate, and they are. I, if, if Europe and the United States stayed anywhere near the range of fluctuation between the dollar and the euro, that the U.S. dollar stays with the Canadian dollar, which is nominally floating, I would be in seventh heaven. It would be way within any range that I think is practical for uh, the major currencies. And, you know, I would say, <laughs> well, Harper, this, we have very close trading relationships which make a difference. But one of the reasons it stays pretty steady is the market expects it to be pretty steady, in my opinion. And, so, and when you convince the market that you have some interest in having it be steady, they'll speculate with you instead of against you, very often, anyway. Well, thank you, Mr. Volker. Let me, on behalf of all of us, Thank you for your, for your lecture and for your very candid answers to our questions. And let me give now the floor to Mr. Lewin, who will close the meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Excellencies, distinguished guests, members of the Foreign Bankers Association and the Stichting John Adams Institute, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor as chairman of the FBA to say thank you again on behalf of all of you here today to Mr. Volker for such a really excellent address. 
and also to thank Mr. Welling, President of the DMB, for his superb introduction and for leading the discussion and question session for us. Mr. Walker, it's been a great privilege for us here to listen to the views of someone as distinguished as yourself and as uniquely well qualified to speak on this subject of our single currency, which is of such immense importance to all of us in Europe. Listening to you as, so to speak, a foot soldier at the front line of this grand European strategy, as many of your audience are today, your speech has given us much to reflect on. The steep and rocky path of preparation for and implementation of EMU has demanded so much of our attention so far that when we have looked up, it has been mainly to look only at the looming storm of the year 2000 and its possible effect on all that we do. With your immense experience and authority, you have prompted us to look up and beyond the immediate difficulties of preparation and implementation. And I must admit I broadly find your comments encouraging, although you have made it clear that there is much uncharted and difficult territory for us to face over the longer term future. As a token of our appreciation and our gratitude for your excellent address, Mr. Balker, I would like to present to you, if I may, this book entitled But Give Me Amsterdam, written by your fellow countryman, Mr. Jules Barber. Also, if I may, I'd like, as is traditional in the FBA, to ask you to accept this FBA watch. And I have one for you too, Mr. Mr. President. <laughs> Finally, I would just like on behalf of the FBA to say how grateful we are to the Stickling John Adams Institute for joining us in arranging this extremely successful event this afternoon. My only remaining duty, ladies and gentlemen, is to ask those of you who have been invited to join us at the FBA annual drinks, which will take place behind me. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>